Thanks very much for coming. Uh, um, my name's Alan Kohler. I'm uh, the um, uh, finance presenter on the news, plus I've got um, uh, I run Business Spectator and Eureka Report uh, and Inside Business. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to a lively and interesting discussion tonight with Tom Elliott and Stephen Main. Tom Elliott is the Managing Director of mm &E Capital uh, Limited, which is a Melbourne-based hedge fund, uh, which he founded in uh, 2001. And Tom also writes for Eureka Report, which is um, a newsletter that I produce uh, with a few others, including Tom. And uh, he used to be executive director of investment bank Flinders Capital. Now, uh, Stephen Main uh, is a Walkley Award winning journalist. Uh, for almost 10 years, worked as a reporter, business editor, gossip columnist, chief of staff for News. I don't know, you were chief of staff? Two Stephen? months. The worst chief of staff in history, but yeah, two months. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, that was uh, on uh, various Australian newspapers, and um, Stephen is most famous for having founded Crikey, the um, website that's now owned by um, private media, uh, Eric, including Eric Beecher, who's the chair of this fine centre, uh, and uh, it continues to be the best-known independent e-zine, and uh, Stephen did a magnificent job with Crikey, <coughs> um, and is now a shareholder activist, um, putting out... Uh, newsletters and generally making an absolute nuisance of himself uh, with company boards, thankfully. Um, and I thought that uh, might be the best way to start would be to stick with some newsy things that are on. Uh, and the thing that, um, uh, that's interesting today is BHP's announced in its quarterly report that um, it's discovered some corruption within the company, or at least the SEC, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission in America, has discovered corruption within BHP. It's told BHP. And um, uh, there appears to be some bribery taking place there, but not in China. Uh, and it, uh, BHP specifically said not China because, of course, Rio Tinto, the other big mining company, did have a bit of a bribery problem in China with Stern Hu. So let's get on to the subject of paying things to people, uh, Stephen. And um, uh, it seems to me that um, bribery is easy. All companies say no bribery, and anyone who pays a bribe gets sacked. Even if you're in Africa and they, or China, and everyone's paying bribes, uh, and it's a kind of an easy, it's an easy win on on corruption. But do you think that it's as simple as that? Are there are there grey? And in particular, I'm thinking about political donations. And what's your view about that? Well, I think uh, in the Western context, uh, political donations are. I regard them as being inherently corrupt, um, institutionalised corrupt, corruption, but legal. And, and uh, it creates the obvious thing where if a developer makes a donation to the Labor Party or the Liberal Party, uh, the question is whether that influences uh, the planning regulator to allow something that perhaps on, on merit wouldn't have been allowed. Uh, if you go into a, 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 say, an African or a third world context where obviously there's, there's far more institutionalised and undisclosed corruption, and if you're in the mineral extraction uh, industry, which is uh, one that's m often most ripe for uh, corruption because it's the largest amount of value available um, in an economy, then the temptation for multinational mining companies, uh, big oil, we've seen it everywhere over the years, is to pay the appropriate people to gain access to the resource. Um, and that's where you then get um, things like the, the US legislation, which prohibits bribing a public official in, anywhere in the world. And if you want to have a, a license to operate, a contract to operate in the US, then you can't do that. So you then get the major international companies which promise they won't do that. Uh, and that comes up against the reality of, in, in, in some countries and markets, you have to do that. And that's the trade-off that they must make. Do they deal? Do they operate? As, uh, as is expected in that market, or do they rise above it and say uh, uh, breaches our standards won't go there? Obviously, AWB uh, made a particular decision in Iraq, uh, 280 million uh, backhanded to Saddam Hussein, massive brand damage, criminal charges, share price from $7 to one, loss of monopoly over wheat in Australia. Clearly, I think they probably made the wrong decision and um, a class actions are falling on them like confetti uh, and you know, their licence to operate in, in other markets was very much jeopardised by their unscrupulous behaviour uh, in Iraq. Um, so in the case of BHP, we don't know the detail, but I, it's about exploration licences. I'd be guessing it's uh, somewhere uh, fairly exotic 
and, um, and I, I'd be guessing that a range of companies have been exposed, maybe from a coup or a change of control somewhere, a range of companies have been exposed to the US regulators and the US regulators have then asked for information from any of those companies that are registered in America trading on the American Stock Exchange and that's where BHP, which is all those things, would come onto the, onto the radar and they've already suffered a great deal of brand damage today to the point where people are openly discussing whether the Australian regulators will now see this as the final nail in the coffin of allowing Rio, Tinto and BHP to merge their Australian iron ore operations. They can't be trusted. Rio has already admitted they're corrupt. BHP suggestions of corruption. This don't allow, allow these companies to become too big and powerful. You can't trust them. And that's an example where a breach actually does jeopardise real business because your brand is, uh, is so important where you, have a, you need a licence to operate to well, uh, extract things. Okay, you speak of licences to operate. You know, we are incredibly hypocritical when it comes to bribery. Now, uh, what did the major television networks get just a couple of months ago when the Winter Olympics was on? They got 250 million bucks handed to them by the federal government. Where did a certain person go skiing and with whom while the Winter Olympics were on? Senator Stephen Conroy, the telecommunications minister. I mean, he was staying with Kerry Stokes at a oh, private... Is that, is that corrupt? Well, it, is, how is it any different? I mean, I don't think he paid for his lift ticket. I very much doubt he paid what about, for his airfare. What about... Um, what about the companies that pay uh, to have lunch with uh, Labor and Liberal politicians? Well, I think it's wrong. In fact, the weird thing is, here in Victoria, uh, there's some opprobrium being attached to a, a lunch that John Brumby put on recently, and yet I saw, see that Ted Bailey is pretty much doing the same thing, probably with the same sorts of people, which, as Stephen would know, would be, largely be property developers and so forth. So, I mean, yeah, but you everyone's, know, it's interesting. Everyone's getting stuck into the politicians about that, but nobody's really criticising the companies. Businesses, no, no. And, and all I'm saying is, it's hypocritical. I mean, if bribery is wrong, and we want to raise this great moral flag and say that it's wrong in overseas countries, well, let's fix it up at home first. I think, you know, Senator Conroy going skiing with Kerry Stokes and walking away and handing over a quarter of a billion dollars to the Australian TV industry, which, by the way, doesn't need that money, protestations to the contrary, that's just an example of first world bribery that seems to be OK. Groveling to media moguls is the highest form of legalised bribery in Australia. It's been going on for generations. Politicians fact, want to stay in power. They do deals fact, with the uh, Packers and the Murdochs. They do it to you, it's Alan, the, don't it's they? The, well, it's the, oldest, <laughs> it's the oldest profession, gentlemen. It is. Um, one brief one, Alan. Uh, if you think about cash for comment, Alan Jones and John Laws, that was a classic example of a protection racket where major corporates were paying the six-figure sums to sit powerful city shock jocks to either get positive things said or to stop negative things being said. Major government inquiry, uh, they, were, they were embarrassed, but then the payments continued. They kept on going. Uh, and the companies weren't being slammed. So my approach as a shareholder activist was to run for the board of every company doing that on a platform of stop doing it and promising to do it every year until they stopped. And the embarrassment factor you know, contributed in a minor way to some of them stopping writing the cheques. But I was amazed how they were prepared to continue paying these turkeys uh, when they'd all been exposed. And it was just yeah, it, it hasn't corrupt. changed. I mean, I, I, a lot of you know I work for 3AW as well. And we get a one-hour lecture once a year on the evils of cash for comment. And then the next week it's the sales and marketing people with how can we, you know, showcase these products more effectively on the radio. So, I mean, it's not, it's not any different. I, no, I, I shouldn't say it. it is different because there's a, there's a code of compliance you have to follow now. But as Stephen said, it still goes on. I think we're off the record tonight, aren't we, Tom? Uh, I yeah. hope we are. Because well, <laughs> I will be off the record. I was, I was at, we're off the radio. Uh, you're not kidding. I was, uh, I was at Bunnings a few uh, a couple of months ago, and there was Tom Elliott broadcasting yes. from Bunnings. Yes. <laughs> so. A wonderful store it is too. <laughs> you were shopping there. The other thing that's uh, been very interesting in the news, a big story, has been Goldman Sachs being charged with fraud by the SEC in America. Um, uh, Goldman Sachs, venerable investment bank, 140 years old, um, charged with fraud. It's tremendously shocking to everybody. Um, Tom, could you firstly explain what you understand they did wrong and tell us whether you think uh, it was wrong? Well, I'll say up front, I, I, on the face of it, I don't think what they did was wrong. In a summary, what they did was Goldman Sachs and a whole lot of other investment banks, including especially Lehman Brothers, it's one of the reasons or the main reason Lehman Brothers went broke, they created a whole lot of uh, obscure in structure but derivative securities based on the value of home loans and bits and pieces thereof. 
So essentially they created these because everybody had decided that the value of homes in America, because been, they'd been going up for some years, could only continue to go up. Uh, let's just put the Australian context out of our minds for the moment. And the investment banks respond, as they always do in any market boom, with creating securities that allow you in different ways to play that boom. Now what happened was that there was a very smart trader called John Paulson, who I met in 2006, and I agreed with what he was saying, but I wasn't smart enough to give him some, of, some, you know, some money to invest. And he was one of the few people that decided that the housing market was, was headed for a bust. And what he did was he went to Goldman Sachs and said, help me, help me create, or create some securities where I can take the negative view, the short view, because and, 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 I think I'm going to be right. So Goldman Sachs just created more of these mortgage-backed securities. They sold them on the buy side to people who had already bought lots and lots and lots of these things, including, would you believe it, you know, people like the Wallara Council up in New South Wales. They bought the Lehman Brothers ones, not the Goldman ones, but there wasn't that much difference. And Paulson took the other side of the bet. Now, as history shows, he was monumentally right and everybody else was monumentally wrong. But in my view, the, the allegation against Goldman's is that they knowingly created something that was bound to fail. I don't think that's true. In fact, the weight of opinion at the time those securities were, were created was that actually they were good. But there were no shortage of buyers for them. What there was a shortage of was sellers. I mean, there was very few people like John Paulson who saw the, the overvaluation in the market. Now, let's say Paulson had been wrong and the US housing market had kept rocketing up like our housing market has. No one would be saying right now that Goldman Sachs was corrupt or whatever. But what's happened is lots and lots and lots of people have lost money and a couple of very visible people have made a lot of money. And whenever that happens, you get accusations, oh, I've been cheated. It's a market. You know, if you want to play in that market, you have to accept the fact that you may lose money. And Paulson, who I have the utmost respect for, picked a bubble ahead of everybody else. Now, all Goldman Sachs did was facilitate that. That's what investment banks always do. If that's corrupt, well, then they're being corrupt every single day of the week. Stephen, could you please explain why he's wrong? Well, um, I mean, to start with, there's a, there's a trader there. Uh, I forget his full name, but he calls himself Fabulous Fab. And they've got... Uh, Fabrice Touré. Fabrice Touré. And they've got emails from him uh, making comments that, you know, the whole thing was going to fall over. Or, you know, words to those effects. But Stephen, but, you know, Goldman Sachs is like Macquarie Bank. Macquarie Bank operates a silo model. I can tell you, every day I get hedge fund traders from Macquarie and UBS who say, this is our opinion, and it's the exact opposite of what their research department thinks. It is OK within a large organisation that different people have different opinions about well, I something. I think they're associating this particular trader with this particular security that was created and his opinion uh, that the market was going to tank. Then you had the way that the, the security was represented as, a, as an outfit called ACA Management, not as a vehicle that was created for the benefit of John Paulson, who was a major client. So the argument goes there's a conflict of interest. They had, a, had an interest in servicing their major client. They created a structure. Uh, was created by a guy who, who is on the record making disparaging comments about the quality of the product. It wasn't represented as to who it was really created for, and there's arguments of you know, conflict of interest and misleading investors and uh, a billion got lost. And, um, and so the SEC is going for misrepresentation. Yeah, but as I said, had, had it gone the other way, had the US housing market kept going up as our market has, remember that economist Stephen Keane the other day has to walk to the top of Mount Kosciuszko because he bet that Australian house prices would fall. I mean, no one's calling him corrupt, but he made the same bet that John Paulson did. Oh, no, I know he didn't create the security, but what I'm saying is, had the market gone in the other direction, no one would be saying anything. No, no, but, the, but the ethical issue in relation to Goldman Sachs mm. has to do with its disclosure. It failed to disclose. This is the SEC's accusation. Now, I don't know if it's right or wrong. Okay, it failed to disclose it's, that Paulson it, had helped them put the, contract, put the security it together. It failed to yeah. disclose that a short seller uh, had constructed the... Um, uh, the CDOs, the securities. And picked securities that he thought would fail, that he yes. thought was of the lowest quality and then yes. knew it would be wrapped up as AAA. No, but, it, no, but here's, okay, now therein lies the problem, wrapped up as AAA. The real problem with these securities is the ratings agencies, and this is the, is the real test that the market's going to go through soon, how did the ratings agencies wrap up stuff that wasn't that great as AAA rated? Now, that is what, and interestingly, the Greek government is, is, is out there trying to twist people's arms to make sure that their securities stay A-rated, because otherwise they won't be able to borrow money on international well, exchanges. No, it's well, it's because these securities are actually like a wine trifle in a glass that's obscure, and the, the jelly and the cream's on top, and the stale sponge is down the bottom. It's like that. And so when you, and when you look at these CDOs, all you can see is 
um, cream and jelly. I, I agree, but look, you know, why did the ratings agencies give it triple A? I mean, there there is a real problem. You know, they they, they are supposedly independent organisations that rated them. True. They yeah. should be going the way of Arthur Anderson. Well, they they should be. Yes. Yes. Now, um, executive remuneration has been in the news because the government has just recently accepted the recommendations of the Productivity Commission uh, to the effect that um, uh, if uh, the um, if 25 per cent of a company's shareholders vote against a remuneration report two, two years in a row, um, then the entire board has to resign. Do you think that's fair enough, Stephen? Well, the entire well, board has to be to, re-elected. Yeah, to it, stand it, for it, re spills the, it spills the entire board. Now, I, I like it in, in, on the grounds that it will focus the minds of the independent directors to get a bit of spine when negotiating with the latest uh, uh, greedy CEO wanting to help himself to a, an unjustified seven-figure sum. Uh, the reality of the situation is that all the tools that you need, uh, uh, plus more, is available right now, in that any shareholder who can get 100 signatures from shareholders or who owns just 5% of the stock can at any time call an EGM and try and get the whole board sacked. But the fact of the matter is that Institutional Australia, uh, the super funds, uh, have never called an EGM to remove directors. And even right now, they're having great difficulty getting them over the line to sack the chairman of guns. Uh, they might finally do it. There's a move afoot to call a meeting to sack the chairman of guns. But this should have happened five years ago. So the problem is the, the institutional investors not using the weapons already available to them. And the classic example of that is that they all very bravely voted against the Qantas remuneration report at the AGM in Perth last year because, oh, wasn't it terrible? Jeff Dixon got $10 million in his last year and $3 million of, of super payout he shouldn't have got. Uh, but why, at the same meeting, did they re-elect James Strong, the chairman of the remuneration committee, with 98 per cent in favour? And it comes down to that question, they will happily vote against remuneration reports that are non-binding, that send a bit of a message, but when it comes to the really hard yards of throwing directors responsible on the scrap heap, they are refusing to use their powers. So a trigger that will automatically put the entire board up for election and then will force institutional investors to make a decision as to how they vote will focus the minds of all sides and I think will temper uh, excessive executive pay. So for that reason, I quite like the reform. What do you think, Tom? I, I think it's a bit problematic. I reckon the law of unintended consequences is going to come in here. I agree with Stephen. It sounds good. I don't have a problem with, you know, if a board can't muster 75 per cent of a vote, it's like with, you know, when companies are being taken over, you've got to get that same sort of vote. If you can't get it, it fails. But the problem is, is that to, to spill an entire board of a company at potentially a crucial time because there's a disagreement on someone's pay could be very, very damaging. You know, it's not, because it's not like they spill and then in the same meeting they suddenly get re-elected. The whole board disappears and the company is effectively without a rudder you know, for that period of time. That's not a good thing if you're in the middle of, say, commercial negotiations. Let's say it happens with BHP in the middle of a corruption negotiation or a corruption action. What happens then? The answer is, I don't know, but I think it would be very damaging as a shareholder. So I think unintended consequences. I think the other thing is, Stephen talks about seven-figure salaries. You know, people tend to add up the, the, the benefits, the, the, the cash, the delayed benefits, the value of options into one sum as though it's just paid in cash. And finally, I think the other thing is, yeah, look, CEOs are paid a lot, but, you know, it's actually a tough job, believe it or not. I mean, I'm not paid a seven-figure salary, so I'm only saying what I read in the paper. But most of them have a pretty short lifespan and a lot of it is expected. And also, uh, a lot of liability is put on their shoulders that they didn't used to get. The average person regards any sum of more than a few hundred grand as being far too much money for anything. But what do you regard as far too much money? What's your figure? I think what I, what I would prefer to see is CEOs get less cash and more shares. I reckon the great thing about getting them shares is that, look, if the share price goes up, maybe it's because the whole market's going up, but a market is composed of individual shares going up. That's what, we, that's what I like to see when I look at a company. Uh, a lot of pay at risk. I don't mind the CEO getting paid a lot as long as the shareholders are getting wealthier. It's when CEOs get paid a lot and the share price is going down that I have a problem. If I can just give Tom a, clip, a quick clip for his uh, first attempt to, as an apologist for the Directors Club. <laughs> um, institutional Australia seem to find it genetically impossible to vote against. And a, a good example of that is David Ryan, who was the chairman of ABC Learning when it collapsed and was chairman of the audit committee from the day he joined the board in 2003, signed off on every dodgy related party transaction, three billion disappears, monumental scandal, how do you go broke providing childcare to Australians when you're getting a million dollars of subsidies out of Canberra a day? 
He did it somehow. And this guy, this guy is still the chairman of Transurban and he's still on the board of Lend-Lease and they got re-elected with 76% in favour at Lend-Lease and 66% in favour at Transurban. So I simply say, if a guy who's blown up $3 billion offering subsidised childcare to Australians cannot be voted off the club, who will be? So the idea... Oh, but that's got nothing to do with pay. I mean, he should be voted off the club because he's presided over a company that went yeah, bust. Yeah, but the idea that, that a whole board will get swept out by these shareholders who just can't vote no in some sort of takeover situation is just unrealistic. Show me the list of directors who've ever been removed for poor performance and then talk about the law of unintended consequences. Well, I think, I think plenty of CEOs get removed. Yeah, well, that's different. No, it's not, it's not different because of all the directors, see, people put a lot of power in the hands of directors. They think directors are capable of, of just doing anything. And also they think the company should never go bust, which simply isn't true. It's interesting. You bring up childcare. Everybody acts as though childcare is a profitable business. You know what? No one's actually made it profitable in Australia. It actually hasn't been proved that it is a profitable business. Uh, you know, if you look at the problem with ABC, so I'm getting off the track, but it's, it's, not, it's not inherently a profitable business. All I'd say is the mere fact that the tenure of CEOs is quite short suggests that CEOs are turfed out of the business if they don't That's perform. That's all boards ever do. They, all, they only ever sack CEOs. They never sack themselves. Well, can I, just, uh, can I just suggest that we hop in the helicopter and get up to a, a higher level? And, uh, and I just want to know, Stephen... Um, uh, do you think that a $10 million salary, for example, to pick a number, is inherently unethical? Uh, no, I think it depends on the, the calibre and the qualities of what someone, someone brings to the table. I, I don't mind Frank Lowy, uh, founder of Westfield, world's largest shopping centre company, getting $10 million a year. I will be going to Sydney for the AGM of Westfield on May 27 and criticising him for the fact he's getting $15 million a year when I know that he's spending about a third of his time on soccer. And I always say to Frank, Frank, you're getting $200 million a year in dividends. You don't need, the family doesn't need the $35 million of salary, which you and the three boys are taking out. Why don't you do a Kerry Packer and work for free? Because the dividends are such a nice little earner for you. But if it came to the crunch and someone who's created that sort of value understands the empire, uh, the thing's making a billion a year, you can run a case for paying Frank Lowy $10 million a year, or you should have the appropriate performance incentives and, you know, for continuing performance. So, by all means, be flexible, look at the performance, but my issue is with the fact that there's just too many people who are average CEOs getting five mil and there's not enough alignment between the good performance and there's too many big payouts for bad performance. So that's, that's where the problem is. Do you think that um, companies these days are often cloaking themselves with ethical behaviour standards and mission statements and corporate social responsibility uh, and so on as a, as a sort of a marketing tool? Well, I think so. I mean, I, I think that we, we all, every, you know, if you ask people, should we be ethical, they'll say yes. You know, ethics are a good thing. I've you know, got a whole bag of them over here somewhere. You know, and yet there's not much debate on what is ethical and what isn't. You know, and I think there's far more differences in what people regard as ethics, just as there is between morals, and morals and ethics are often held to be pretty much the same thing. Um, you know, so I think, I think a lot of companies pay lip service to it, and uh, that's because they, they just state we will be ethical. And they might even have a statement of values, but it doesn't really penetrate too far down the food chain. It usually takes, you know, something really bad happening or something very embarrassing or, you know, some expose in the newspaper or the television to, to sort of force them into action. But I do think at the, at, at the head of it, there is a problem because we don't have enough forums where people actually debate what ethics means. And, I mean, I'll give you an example, and Stephen and I have spoken about this, you know, should companies donate money to charity? You know, personally, I think it's wrong. I mean, I, I, an organisation I'm involved with happens to have a person who's a very strong Catholic who's running it, and we are f doing lots of things for Catholic charities. I fundamentally disagree with them. Yeah, I don't have any choice. I mean, I can argue with him, but it's not worth the time. But the point is, he's picking charities that some people think are great and other people think, like me, are just wrong. I think the best thing to do for companies is that they just make money for their shareholders. Their shareholders can then decide what charities they want to give it to. Other people disagree with that. That's an example of where there isn't common ground on what is a common ethical issue as to how many community or what sort of community organisations and charities companies should donate. Uh, Stephen, that raises the question, I suppose, as to whether a corporation really is, is an ethical entity uh, or is it simply there to make money for owners of, of the corporation to then behave ethically themselves? 
Well, its, it's prime motivation is to make money, but I believe in the social contract and the licence to operate and believe that there is a, a, a synergy between making an investment in your corporate citizenry and making more money. And, uh, you know, I'm on Man Manningham Council and we get developers who come through and the first thing we always ask them is, with the water recycling, are you putting it through the toilets? And they always say, well, yes, we have to now because the customers are demanding it. Uh, and there's a higher expectation from the buyers. And so um, I, 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 don't, I think gratuitously giving, a, giving money away to football clubs or charities that have nothing to do with your business is a waste of money. But on something like, say, BHP, with their ability to have a licence to operate uh, in Outback Australia, in the Pilbara, with native title and all those sorts of things, I think it is good business and good for society that BHP invests a lot in Indigenous art and Indigenous programs, and I think there's a, it all goes together. So that's, that's why I would support companies building their brands and visibly supporting um, social causes, but also ensuring that it infu is infused into the culture of the organisation. It's not just writing a cheque and going to the opening night at the opera and thinking that you're doing your bit. You need to set the standards uh, uh, culturally and ethically from the top, and you can do that with partnerships with organisations that work in the social space.